the end of the world as we know it. Who's ready? Who's not? Nuclear war fear over Y2K bug. Are we headed for a global Y2K crisis? Fearing the effects of the Y2K bug, families stock up. These are all headlines from popular newspapers in the months leading up to, the, uh, leading up to January 1st, 2000. When, during this time, people thought there was going to be a global crisis. This scare, according to National Geographic, was based on the claim that when intricate computer programs were being written in the 1960s, computer programmers used a two-digit code to indicate the year since computer storage space was limited and expensive. Thus, 1970 would just be recorded as 70. 1980 would just be recorded as 80, and so on. So as the year 2000 drew nearer, programmers realized that computers might not recognize that the year is actually 2000 and not 1900. This could cause many issues for places that rely heavily on computers to control and regulate their information. Places such as banks could be in potential danger of having computers um, actually subtract 100 years worth of interest rather than applying an extra day's worth of interest. Power plants also relied on computers to control and regulate their systems. Airlines were at risk for having their information compromised due to these computer errors. These claims that the computers wouldn't be able to keep up caused people to alter their lives to prepare for the worst. For instance, Jay Wishner, an internet consultant from New York, was asked about Y2K, and he said, I'm waiting for disaster. I have cases of food, cases of rice, containers of water, canned ham, and vegetables. I'm going to live better with or without Y2K. New York teacher Linda B. said she had been preparing for Y2K for six months. Brooklyn native Nasir Ahmed said, I'm not really worried but I'm paying enough attention that I have enough food, water, and light in case there's no electricity. According to CNN, people, spent, people across the globe spent around $200 billion preparing for the year 2000. People in the U.S. alone spent $100 billion of those dollars. They were willing to alter their entire lives, spending billions of dollars, based on unfounded claims that computers might not be able to tell that the year changed from 1999 to 2000. But the question I have is, if people were willing to alter their lives based on these unfounded claims, how much more should claims that are backed by evidence change our lives? So we're going through 2 Peter, and in chapter 1 of 2 Peter, Peter challenges his readers to live lives characterized by the pursuit of godliness. However, there were those who were not followers of Christ who viewed Christians in a very similar way to how we view those people who changed their lives when the year switched to 2000. Maybe it seems like they're a little bit nuts. Uh, There's no real foundation for these claims, but their lives were altered. However, there is a difference between Christians and Y2K preppers. Christians are not living their lives based on unfounded claims. We have witnesses which confirm our belief in God's promised redemption and Jesus' return establishing his kingdom. So if you have your Bibles, please open them to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21, or follow along in the bulletin you received when you came in tonight. So Peter claims in the first chapter that as New Testament scholar Tom Schreiner puts it, living a godly life is optional if one's heavenly destiny is not involved. Because of this group that was teaching that Jesus wasn't going to return and that his return was simply a myth, you could live however you wanted to. 
So countering this claim, Peter calls upon three witnesses to confirm God's promise of Jesus' return. And tonight, we're going to look at those three witnesses that confirm God's promise. Let's look at verse 16. For we did not follow clearly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter wastes no time in responding directly to the critiques that the teaching of the apostles is just a mere myth. Now, in its cultural context, there's two possible ways for us to understand what Peter means by myth. What is this accusation that these people are bringing against the teachings of the apostles? The first is this. The word myth was often used in Greek culture to tell stories about the Greek gods, which were not literally true, but they did communicate some helpful moral that the people could live by. The second option is this. The word uh, myth used here could also be understood as a fable or just a story that is not only untrue, but it is pure fantasy. They are stories that have no basis in reality and no moral point for the people to live by. And so looking at the full phrase that Peter uses, clearly devised myths, this second option seems to make the most sense. False teachers were not just saying, oh, they might have a good message, it'll help people live better, but it's not true stories. No, what they were doing was they were ridiculing and mocking Christians for their belief as what they deemed pure fantasy with absolutely no grounding in reality. So it would make sense then that if the false teachers were right, there would be no reason for us to pursue godliness in our lives. Because Jesus' promised return was under attack, Peter counters this accusation by calling on his first witness. Look at the second half of verse 16. It says, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So the first witness that confirms God's promise is the witness of the apostles. Let me say that again. The first witness that confirms God's promise is the witness of the apostles. Now, I don't think I'm the only one, but I really love crime TV shows. The only problem is, once you've seen enough of them, you begin to be able to figure them out. You begin to be able to predict what's going to happen. Most of them go something like this. A terrible murder happens and no one knows who did it. The murderer did a great job, in fact, cleaning up the scene, leaving no apparent evidence behind that could tie him to the murder. So the detectives look, leaving no stone unturned, and they finally believe they have the piece of evidence that they need to convict their suspect when the show cuts to the classic courtroom scene. In the courtroom, the evidence is presented. The judge and jury are convinced. The judge is just about to make his sentence when at the last moment, an eyewitness of the crime bursts into the room, gives his, sec- his testimony at the last second, allowing the innocent to walk free and the guilty party to be convicted. What happens? The eyewitness proves the truth. Peter's point is this. Your pursuit of godliness and your belief in Jesus and his second coming is not in vain. The apostles were there. The text tells us they were witnesses of the majesty of Jesus proving this truth. But the question we have to ask is, what is this that they witnessed? What does this majesty of Jesus, what is he talking about? They couldn't have witnessed his second coming as that is still yet to come. So what did they witness that Peter believed confirms the second coming of Jesus? Let's look at the first half of verse 17. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, we're just going to stop there. Peter and the apostles witness uh, an event that has become known as the transfiguration of Jesus. And in order for us to fully understand the point Peter is trying to make here, we need to take a look back at this event in Matthew chapter 17. Please follow along with me on the screen as I read this passage for us. 
Matthew chapter 17, starting in verse 1. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. He was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. In this event, Jesus leads some of the apostles, including Peter, up on a high mountain. When they reached the top of the mountain, the text tells us that Jesus was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. His appearance changed right before their very eyes. His skin and clothes shone with absolute brilliance, pointing to his glory and his purity. But again, why is Peter, Peter bringing up this point Uh, It's seemingly random story about a time when Jesus' appearance changed. What does that have to do with his second coming? Well, here's the thing. The transfiguration was a transformation of Jesus' appearance, yes. But it was also the apocalypse of Jesus' true nature as king. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the transfiguration event follows directly after the declaration that Jesus' kingdom is coming, and it's coming with power. This leads Peter to believe that the transfiguration event, of which he and several of the apostles were eyewitnesses, this serves for him as proof of Jesus' promised return. The reason being, as one commentator put it, the transfiguration anticipates the second coming, for it unveils the glory that will belong to Jesus at his second coming. Right after Jesus' appearance was changed, the Gospel of Matthew points out that Moses and Elijah showed up, and they began having a conversation with Jesus. Now, we don't know what they were talking about, but fittingly to Peter's character, he decides that in this moment, that it's a good time to interrupt Jesus' conversation with Moses and Elijah. And all he does as he interrupts this conversation, as he interrupts it with a comment that shows his confusion about what is actually happening. Good job, Peter. You've done it again. So it's kind of like that moment I'm sure we've all had when we begin to overhear our friends having a conversation and we are so confident that we know what they are talking about that we jump into the conversation and what comes out of our mouth has absolutely nothing to do with what they are actually talking about and all we are left with is the feeling like we are complete buffoons. I imagine this is Peter here. For what Peter has done in this moment in interrupting this conversation and agreeing to or or offering to build these tents for them is he has confused the similarities and the differences between Moses, Elijah, and Jesus himself. In this small interruption, he sees Jesus in the same way he views Moses and in the same way he views Elijah. But Matthew tells us that while Peter was still in the middle of his confused babbling, a cloud overshadowed them and a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It's to this voice which Peter refers to in 2 Peter right here, and that is his second witness. The first is the witness of the apostles, the eyewitness testimony. The second witness that confirms God's promise is the witness of God himself. Say that again. The second witness that confirms God's promise is the witness of God himself. It's in the midst of this transfiguration event that God the Father speaks in what appears to be a direct address to Peter in order to clear up the confusion he had regarding the nature of Jesus. Jesus is who he says he is. 
He truly is the Son of God, the King. He truly is one in nature with God. He is God. So it's ironic that Peter was the one on the mountain who was confused and had to be corrected by God himself and is now using this event in the epistle to confirm that Jesus is indeed king. Jesus is indeed God. It's almost as if Peter is saying, "Uh, hey guys, remember that time I was confused about what was going on? I I imagine people asked him which time. But he's, I'm... Remember when I was confused about what was going on, about who Jesus is? And then remember when God like, had to interrupt me, interrupting Jesus, uh, and he bared witness about who Jesus actually is? Yeah, maybe you should take a hint and learn from my mistakes, please. Now, when I was in college, uh, me and my friends used to get into super nerdy debates about the most random things. Um, for instance, how you pronounce the name of the 4th century African theologian, Augustine. Or is it Augustine? I remember my friend and I were debating this. We couldn't come to any conclusion about it. So we decided to take this debate to our church history professor, who's one of the top professors of church history in the world. We had our own thoughts about it, but we knew that if anyone knew the correct answer, it was going to be him. So we, took, we made sure the next morning we went to class, we got there really early so that we could bring this debate before him and ask him what he thought. All I have to say is, he said it was Augustine, which is what I said it should have been. But he said it was Augustine. The debate ended there because, why? One of the top church history professors in the world gave us what we needed to know. The person most qualified to answer the question we had gave us the answer. So now when anyone asks me how to pronounce his name, I point back to this moment when my professor helped me know the answer when I was confused about it. This is like what Peter's doing here. He's pointing back to a time when he was confused about the nature of Jesus and the most qualified person to correct his confusion did in fact correct that confusion. Just like when I went to someone I knew could help clear up the confusion I had, Peter points to the witness of God the Father to confirm the promised return of Jesus. Let's look at verses 19 through 21. Peter continues, and we have something more sure, the prophetic word to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Peter's first witness he calls upon to confirm God's promise is the witness of the apostles. The second is the witness of God himself. The third witness that Peter calls on to confirm the promise of Jesus' return is the witness of Scripture. The witness of Scripture. Now, Peter tells his audience that they have something more sure, the prophetic word. What he means by prophetic word is not just the prophets, not the Old and the New Testament together, but rather he is referring to the Old Testament, which was the written word that his audience would have had. And when he tells them they have something more sure, he's not telling them that Scripture is a more reliable source than the witness of the apostles and the witness of God himself, but rather because of the two first two witnesses, we can say with complete certainty that the prophets were in fact writing about the coming of Jesus, the establishment of his kingdom, which is brought to its completion at his second coming. In the midst of these false teachers accusing the apostles of teaching myths, Peter says, because of these things, Christians can be assured that his kingdom will be established. And it's because of this certainty that Peter says um, he urges his readers to pay attention to the scriptures as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Now, here in Chicago, 
I'm not sure we know what the word dark means. But, however, I spent a majority of my life living in southwest Colorado. And where I'm from in Colorado, if you don't have a flashlight on at night, you're not going to know where you're going. It gets completely dark. Now, most of the time, that didn't bother me. I was fine. I knew when I needed to keep a light with me, and I kept it with me, and I got where I was going. However, I remember one time at summer camp when I was in high school, we loved to play capture the flag at night. And so I was out, and I thought I was so cool, crawling through the the bushes and hiding from everyone and um, being really good at capture the flag, because that's going to look good on a resume is what I thought. It didn't. But when I was crawling through the bushes, what ended up happening was I lost my flashlight because I had turned it off for a moment when the other team was coming by so that they wouldn't see me. So I lost my flashlight as I was crawling through the brush. I had no clue where I was going or how to get back to where I needed to be. So I was smart. I stayed where I was until one of my teammates came with their flashlight. So after a little while passed, one of them finally showed up We used their flashlight to get us back to the main path, which took us back to the main part of camp where we needed to be. The flashlight helped us get where we needed while dodging the many obstacles and dangers that you find in the middle of the forest at night. And so in the same way, Peter urges his readers to pay attention to the scriptures as I paid attention to that flashlight that helped me find the path that led me back to the main area of the camp. It's in the darkness of this present world that Scripture acts as the light that helps to illuminate God's purposes and plans concerning the end of history, which enables us to live differently in the present. What happens in the future should dictate how we live in the present, and Scripture gives us the insight into what is coming so we know how to change our lives and how we live now while we await the return of Jesus. Continuing in verse 19, Peter gives his readers the exact amount of time even that they need to continue to listen to and be illuminated by the prophetic word. He says, in fact, listen to it until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Now, what he's referring to here is the second coming of Jesus Christ. We must allow Scripture to act as our guide until the day that Christ returns and sets the world right, when He will be there to give us instruction and to illuminate us Himself. Now, he said morning star as well. Morning star was a reference to the planet Venus in the ancient world, as it would often remain bright enough to see in the morning even after all the other stars faded away. Now, it is possible that Peter is referring to the prophecy in Numbers chapter 24, verse 17, uh, which points to Jesus saying, a star will come out of Jacob. But while it is unclear if this is what he is intending, we do understand that this clause is actually a pictorial description of the way in which, at his coming, Christ will dissipate the doubt and uncertainty by which believers' hearts are meanwhile beclouded and will fill them with a marvelous illumination. Now, as a teacher, I get asked the question, why, all the time. And I've learned how to anticipate the whys and answer them before they even get asked. And I think this is exactly what Peter is doing here in verses 20 through 21. I imagine his audience would want to ask, Why should they approach Scripture this way? Why should they allow Scripture to act as this light during this time? Well, he answers before they can ask. He tells them, no prophecy of Scripture comes from one's own interpretation. This is likely a way of countering the false teacher's interpretation of what the prophets said concerning Jesus. And in responding to these false teachers, Peter gives us insight into the nature and origin of Scripture. He warns his readers not to pay attention to just any interpretation of the Scriptures because the meaning of the text, which is a result of interpretation, has a divine origin, not a human origin. So when you follow the teaching of Scripture, you are not following some man's 
teaching, but you are in fact following the teaching of God. For look at verse 21. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Scripture is not a book written by man, but rather it is God's plan of redemption given to us, and he used men who were guided by the Holy Spirit to write it down for us. Scripture is from God and God alone, and thus the meaning of Scripture is from God and God alone. We do not get to make Scripture mean what we want it to mean. It's not a vending machine where we can push a button and get a cute, nice little verse that we can paste on any of our opinions that we want to and make it seem like our opinion is approved by God. Rather, we must submit all of our opinions and thoughts and desires before God as we encounter Him in Scripture and be willing to allow God's Word, the whole of God's Word, to transform us into the people that God has called us to be. So what's the bottom line? The future return of Jesus, as has been confirmed by the witness of the apostles, by God the Father, and by the witness of Scripture is certain. The establishment of Jesus' kingdom on earth has already begun and will be completed at his return. So Peter's challenge to his readers is to pursue, uh, to pursue godliness in the present is not some form of legalism or simple behavior modification, but rather a call to reality. The reality is this. Jesus' kingdom has already begun, and as Christians, we are members of this kingdom. This is why we pray, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Not just as a way of looking forward to his return, but as a way of helping others to experience the kingdom through their interactions with us. The church, being us, should be a little piece of heaven on earth. As one professor says, God is not trying to create a community of spectators who sit around observing, analyzing, and commenting on the world. God is remaking us to be makers. He's renewing us to be actors, to be agents of renewal who are at work in God's world with a vision of shalom that is pulling our labor towards the kingdom. Peter's point for us is this. Jesus' second coming, in which he will permanently and fully establish his kingdom, is certain. It is because of this, as members of this kingdom, that we cannot sit back as spectators, but we must pursue godliness in our daily lives and actually live as members of the kingdom that we claim to be a part of. We are. Our belief in the second coming of Jesus and this established kingdom changes how we live our lives in the present. And unlike those who change their lives based on the unfounded claims of Y2K, our present lives are changed because of the certainty of our future with Jesus and his kingdom. We must pursue godliness and desire to help others experience the kingdom as we introduce them to our king, Jesus Christ, who came once to inaugurate his kingdom and is coming back to fully and permanently establish his throne and his kingdom forever. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, May your name be praised. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Help us to be the kingdom people that you have called us to be, having spoken to us this evening through your word. Let none of us leave this place unchanged, but rather transformed more into your likeness. Be with us as we leave this place. And as John says in the book of Revelation, he who testifies to these things, surely I am coming soon. 
Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen.